So my topic for today is hack your learning habits for language learning success or how to get yourself to actually do what you want to do. This is one of the big challenges in life is actually getting ourselves to do what we know we want to do. Um, just a bit about the structure of the talk today. I'll give a little introduction to Lingoda and myself. I'll talk about why habits matter in language learning, and I'll talk about how to build habits that work. Um, a little bit to begin with about Lingoda and myself. Um, Lingoda is a top online language school. We've served over 100,000 students from 171 countries. We teach small group and private classes, and we have classes available 24 seven, every day of the year. And we can do this because we have over 1,500 teachers located around the world in different time zones. So we can actually pretty much have round the clock lessons at any one time. We also have a lot of classes available. We have over 3,000 lessons in English, Spanish, French, and German, and we follow a structured curriculum based on the CEFR. And this curriculum is where I come in. My role is as curriculum lead, and my mission is to develop our curriculum and learning experience for our general language courses. We think habits are really important at Lingoda. It's part of our learning values that we believe there are no shortcuts for learning to speak another language, like playing an instrument or training for a marathon. We know it takes time. And we also know that everybody can learn a language. Anyone who makes learning a habit will improve. And we aim to be there with those learners every step of the way. But when I read this, I keep on getting hung up on anyone who makes learning a habit, because this is sometimes easier said than done. I think we've all known this from our own efforts to form and maintain habits. We know they're beneficial, but they can be really hard to follow through on in practice. And that's what I want to unpack in this webinar. What habits have to do with language learning and how we can help ourselves to get there. My own interest in habits, though, reaches back a bit further. I first started being interested in habits and language learning when I worked as a language teacher. I taught for several years, mostly migrants to Germany, and these were learners in really challenging circumstances who had moved to Germany and often didn't have any bridge language um, to their teachers. They maybe didn't speak English, I didn't speak their language, and they were having to build a whole new life for themselves in a new country. And for a portion of those learners, they were in an even more difficult situation that they also needed literacy training at the same time as learning the language. So they were trying at the same time to start a new life in a new country, learn to speak and understand German and learn to read and write German at the same time from a teacher who didn't speak their language. And what I noticed about this group of students that got me really interested in habits was that at the start of a new course, I would notice that some learners maybe found it a bit easier, um, picked things up a bit faster, or maybe they already knew some letters and others were really struggling and starting from a starting point where this could be their first ever time, even in a classroom in their lives. But over the weeks and months that followed, those learners who made progress were not necessarily the ones who at the beginning seemed to find it easier. They were the ones who showed up day in, day out, and sat down every day and spent time copying out words, repeating, engaging with the content. And this was my first big lesson in perseverance trumping talent. And this really got me thinking about how important habits are for making progress in learning and in language learning in particular. Lots of people have commented on how habits shape our lives, despite seeming like very small, insignificant actions, how they add up to form. I don't think it's too dramatic to say our destiny. Gretchen Rubin writes, habits are the invisible architecture of daily life. We repeat about 40% of our behavior almost daily, so our habits shape our existence and our future. If we change our habits, we change our lives. 
William James writes quite prophetically, all our life so far as it has a definite form is but a mass of habits, practical, emotional and intellectual, systematically organized for our weal and woe and bearing us irresistibly towards our destiny. I really like Virginia's Wolf comment on habits because she points out something really important about them. Each habit that we do or don't do is in itself so small, it's almost imperceptible, and yet the cumulative impact is enormous. Habits gradually change the face of one's life as time changes one's physical face and one does not know it. But why are habits so important in language learning? Why do they matter so much in this field? I think there are several reasons for this. The first one is just the scale of the challenge. Anyone who's tried to learn a language knows there are no shortcuts. It takes a really long time. If we look at the recommended hours of guided study per CFR level from different um, relevant bodies, we can see that it's a long time that you're gonna to have to put in to get to the level that most people would regard as fluency. So if we're looking at B2, it varies somewhat by language, sometimes there's a range of estimates, but we're looking at around 500 hours of guided study. Guided study means time in the classroom with a teacher. It doesn't count the homework, the additional classes, the additional repetitions, reviewing vocabulary or incidental learning in unstructured settings. So it's a really big time commitment and therefore not something that you can just do when you get a burst of motivation. It's something you're gonna to have to chip away at over time. And part of the reason for this is the amount that has to be learned to reach each level, especially in terms of vocabulary. If we look at the estimated vocabulary size per level, we can see it's a lot of words. Um, Researchers divide vocabulary between active vocabulary. These are the words that you know and you feel comfortable using and you use yourself and passive vocabulary, which are the words that you might not use yourself but would recognize in context in a text or if you're listening to someone speaking. And you'll notice that the passive vocabulary is usually around twice the size of the active vocabulary. And it's a decent number of words to reach B2, which for many people is their target level, we're looking at about 2,500 words that they master actively and another 5,000 words that they would recognize. Active vocabulary we usually master in class or in a guided context. Um, often, uh, we, because we're using the words actively, we're speaking them. Passive vocabulary is usually acquired through exposure and quite extended exposure, extensive reading, extensive listening. And we might look at this and be put off. We might look at this and think, that is a mountain, how do I possibly climb it? And that makes me think of this image or this joke, how do you eat an elephant? I was gonna ask in the chat if anyone knows the answer to this um, joke, or not joke, it's not very funny, um, but this uh, truism, but um, as the chat doesn't seem to be working, I'll skip that. But um, the answer to how to eat an elephant is, one bite at a time. You can't sit down and eat a whole elephant. You can only take one bite at a time. And I would probably say you wouldn't want to eat an elephant in one sitting. You'd want to take, you'd want to take it bit as it comes. And if we see vocabulary in the same way, one word at a time, but keeping going, it's actually amazing what we can achieve. I think of habits as a kind of compound interest in that they snowball one word a day is a very small amount. And you might think, what would one word a day do? How could that possibly get me towards my learning goals? That's just a couple of minutes of study. But one word a day is 360 words a year. If we increase that a bit, two words a day, that's 730 words a year. And if we go back to 730 words, that's taking you well above A2, it's moving you up two levels with just five words a day, uh, two words a day. Five words a day, 1,825 words. Now we're talking about approaching B2 level just with five words a day and 10 words a day, a whopping 3,600 words a year, which would put you somewhere between B2 and C1 in vocabulary terms. So breaking it down one word at a time, 
trusting the process of it accumulating and the results can be far better than we could ever have imagined. The same is true of reading. Reading one page a day might not sound like a lot, but in a year, you'll have read 360 pages. And by my maths of estimating around 300 words per page, you'll have read 108,000 words a year. Scale that up to 10 pages a day, and you've read 3,600 pages. That's as many as about 12 books. And you'll have encountered a whopping 1.8 million words, which is a phenomenal number. The next reason that habits and regularity are so important in learning languages has to do with the way that languages are stored in the brain. Monica Schmidt writes, vocabulary knowledge exists in a densely connected network, which means that we need only be reminded of a word that sounds similar to a foreign language word for our brain to recall it. A slight ludge in the right part of the brain and it comes flooding back. I don't know if you've ever experienced this phenomenon, but I definitely have. When I've had a language that's been a bit rusty, for me it's French, and I've had a conversation and it's been quite hard going, the, the vocabulary hasn't really been there. And as I've warmed up to the conversation, the vocabulary has come back, but not only on the topic that I was reviewing in that conversation, but a whole flood of other vocabulary comes back as well. Because of the way that vocabulary is stored as a network in your brain, it means, just a little bit of contact, even as Monica says, hearing a word that sounds similar to another word is enough to reactivate the whole network. So a little bit every day can actually have an incredible effect on keeping your language alive. This is for language that's already in your long-term memory, but you might not be able to access because it's rusty and you haven't retrieved it for a long time. To get language into your long-term memory, habits are also really important. And that's because of a phenomenon called spaced repetition. I'm sure you've heard of spaced repetition. It's the kind of technology that powers lots of flashcards and reviewing devices. And it takes advantage of the fact that, or helps us counteract the fact that when we don't review, the forgetting curve is really brutal. If we start with 100% retention, we will precipitously fall down to 60% retention by day three. And spaced repetition is a really effective way of dealing with this. If you review and wait until your retention starts to dip a little bit and then review again and boost it, you can then review at increasingly long intervals until the word is anchored in your long-term memory. But of course, to do this needs consistent practice. Massed practice where you cram a lot of words in a short period of time isn't nearly as effective as a little bit often, especially if you combine that with a spaced repetition system. The next way that habits relate to language learning is about building automation. I like to use the metaphor of learning to drive for this because I think that's a really good example of what automation is. When we first learn to drive, it's really hard and we have to use a lot of brain power to work out what to do and have to really concentrate and consciously carry out actions. There's no shortcut through knowledge or reading manuals. You have to actually do it, much like language learning, you have to actually speak it. But to begin with, it's a very consciously directed process. You're thinking when to indicate, when to put your foot on the clutch, when to change gears. And that's taking up pretty much all of your mental capacity. But over time, this becomes automated so that you are driving and doing all of these things that used to require a lot of concentration without even thinking about it. It's on autopilot. And once we've established a habit of doing something or of studying, that also goes on to autopilot and we don't have to devote conscious effort to maintaining that habit. In driving, when you automate driving, it means your brain is freed up to focus on the road and where you're going or maybe what's on the radio or your companions. And it becomes much easier and allows you to free your brain up for more interesting things. And it's really the same with habits. Once you've got the habit going, very little momentum and willpower is required to keep it going. But there's another way in which habits and automation and language learning are connected. 
And that's that lots of language usage in itself needs to become automatized in order to feel comfortable and to develop fluency. When we first learn irregular verbs, much like the beginner driver focusing on where to move the clutch, we're having to use a lot of brain power to think about what the right ending is, what the right conjugation is, which person, what matches it. And over time, this becomes second nature. And that frees you up to focus on what you actually want to say, which is the really important part of speaking a language. But it's only through a lot of repetition that we get to the point where the verbs come out and flow naturally. And it's the same with formulaic language, with chunks of language. Lots of what we say is not being assembled in our brains word by word using grammar rules. We just know it as a whole phrase, like at the end of the day, or by the way, or even a sentence like, I hope you don't mind. And once that's been stored, because you've retrieved it lots of times, that also is a shortcut to fluency, but it needs a lot of repetition to become just an automatically available chunk. So language learning has a lot of advantages. Um, habit foot building has a lot of advantages for language learning, the last of which is identity. And in some ways, I think this is the most important. Habits shape our identity and our identity shapes our habits. James Clear talks about the feedback loop between our habits and our identity. Your habits are how you embody your identity, but at the same time, the more you repeat a behavior, the more you re reinforce the identity associated with that behavior. So if we take an example of how habits and identity play in together and use the context of language learning, if you have an identity of yourself as a language learner, and you think of yourself as a learner, you're much more likely to maintain the habits that would go with that identity, like reviewing words frequently or seeking out opportunities to speak a language or traveling to new countries. But it can work the other way too. It doesn't have to start with identity. If we start the behavior of regularly engaging with foreign languages, over time, the identity of yourself as a language learner will start to develop too. And that will form a positive feedback loop where your identity is feeding your habits, which are feeding your identity. And this is really important because researchers increasingly recognize the role that identity plays in driving language learning behavior. There's a nice quote here from Durai, which is a little bit um, wordy, but I think it's worth um, engaging with because the concept in it is so powerful. Um, Durai talks about the ideal L2 self which is essentially like the idealized picture you have of yourself as a speaker of another language and talks about how this motivates us to learn. If the person we would like to become speaks an L2, a second language, the ideal L2 self is a powerful motivator to learn the L2 because of the desire to reduce the discrepancy between our ideal, our actual and ideal selves. So let's say I had an image of myself in my mind as a fluent and competent speaker of Italian. And this was my ideal L2 self. The image of myself as a fluent and confident Italian speaker is what would motivate me to keep pushing through and learning Italian in order to close the gap between who I am now, a not very competent Italian speaker, and this image of myself of who I want to become as a fluent speaker. So, Habits, really important for learning languages, but if they're so great, why do they so often fail? And this is where I'd love to hear from you about the difficulties you've had in forming habits. Luckily for this, we don't need the chat. Um, we can bypass that so we can communicate via Mentimeter. Um, if you have a phone, you can point your, your camera at the QR code and go directly to Mentimeter. If you don't, you can go to www.menti.com and use the code here. And I'd love it if you would use that opportunity to answer the question, what challenges have you had forming habits? It could be habits for language learning, or it could just be habits in general. I'll give you a moment to use the code and get yourself up onto Mentimeter.
Okay, let's have a look at some of the problems people have had. Time, yeah, that's a big one. Being tired, time again. Yeah, getting frustrated, motivation, other priorities. Starting, that's always really difficult. Um, discipline, motivation again, consistency, making them stick, mental health problems with depression, finding a time for it. Yep, life getting in the way with unexpected commitments, neurodiversity, making it harder to form habits and maintain them. Unforeseen breaks. Yep, it can be really hard once we've built a habit and got into a great habit to get back into it after a, maybe a vacation or um, a life circumstance. Learning different languages at the same time. Yep, that's really challenging. So I'm really interested that the problems that you anticipated tally very much with the things that I expected um, people to struggle with from my conversations with language learners. Lack of time seems to be a really common one. Getting frustrated, someone talked about being frustrated and that's related to lack of visible progress. Um, sometimes people just forget. Sometimes you have a great intention with a habit and you mean to, but the day goes by and you suddenly realize it's the end of the day and you haven't done what you meant to do. We get bored sometimes, distractions. This could be an internal distraction or it can be an external distraction, something in life happening and being a pressing requirement that you give it some attention. Um, analysis paralysis, and that's quite common when you're not sure where to start because there's so many options and there's so many paths you could take and you think about where to start and don't actually begin. So knowing this, what can we do about it? The first thing I'd like to say is you are not the problem. Um, some of your comments had things like lacking discipline. And I think in my experience, problems with habits are rarely a problem with the person and some moral failing like a lack of discipline or laziness it is often related to the way that you're setting habits they might be too vague they might be too ambitious you might not have safeguards for what you're going to do if you get derailed um sometimes the habits we set up aren't very rewarding sometimes there's a lack of self-knowledge in knowing ourselves and what really works for us that can make it hard to maintain a habit and I think this is a big one. I think people often rely on motivation and willpower alone and expect that to be enough to ride through on a habit. And when we do this, this is when often life gets in the way or when fluctuations in mood, which is something that people mentioned on Mentimeter can also trip us up. But first things first, before we look at how to hack a habit and make it rock solid, this sounds really obvious, but make sure this is a habit you actually really do want to adopt. <laughs> Gretchen Rubin talks about red herring habits, which is a habit that we loudly claim we want to adopt when we don't actually intend to do so. And we might do this for all sorts of reasons. Um, sometimes because someone's bothering us about something, we want to get someone off our back. So we say, yes, 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 I'm going to do it. Or maybe we're deceiving ourselves and we kind of like the idea of ourselves as someone who's learning Korean, but we don't actually really intend to follow through on it or really want to follow through on it. So the first check is just to make sure that the habit you're trying to build is something you really want. Then once you're sure you want to do it, clarify what the behavior is that you're trying to establish. This is the other place where I think people often get a bit um, off track. It's really important to distinguish between the aspiration, what's the vague idea of the thing that we want to happen, the outcome, what does that look like, and the actual behavior that we wish to adopt, the habit. And we need to make the outcomes and behaviors as concrete as possible. Let's take an example, someone who wants to learn French, who wants to understand French better. That's the aspiration. It's great to have an aspiration, I want to understand French better. But it's easy to confuse that with the habit and think my habit is I want to learn to understand French better. What we need to do in this case is to narrow it down. What is the actual outcome that we're trying to achieve? What would it mean to us to understand French better? It might be be able to understand Netflix shows, that subtitles. This is already good. We've got a clear goal, something we're aiming at. It's a lot clearer now. 
but it's still not a behavior. If I'm trying to build a habit, it still doesn't tell me what I'm supposed to be doing on Thursday evening. We need to go one step further and say, what's the habit? What's the behavior? An example here could be, watch 20 minutes of French TV shows with subtitles every day and note down unfamiliar vocabulary. That could be the habit that you're trying to build. And you might change what the habit is over time. Maybe you'd start out watching with subtitles and later watch without subtitles, but it's really important that you're crystal clear what is the behavior? What is the response? What do I want to actually do? Another example, I want to improve my German skills. That's a nice aspiration, but what does that mean to you? Okay, I want the outcome of passing the Goethe Institute B2 exam. And what am I gonna do? What's the behavior? I'm gonna attend two classes a week and review flashcards for 10 minutes a day. Now we're talking, now we have a chance of establishing a behavior. We have no space here for analysis paralysis and the wheels spinning and not knowing where to start because we've clarified what it is we want to do. When it comes to carrying out the behavior, this is when it's helpful to look at the anatomy of a habit, to look at what actually a habit consists of. We often focus on this part here, stage three, the response. The response is what is the thing that you do? But the thing that you do is actually stage three of a longer process and needs to be reinforced by a stage four in order to happen again. In order for the response to happen, two other things have to happen first. First of all, there has to be a cue. Something has to remind you or alert you to wanting to do the thing. If nothing impinges on you from externally or internally to put this in your mind, you're not gonna do the behavior. Then once you've had the cue, you have to have a craving. A, des a craving sounds like an addiction. We can just think of it as a desire to do it. Then we have to have the response where we do it. And lastly, and really importantly, there has to follow a reward. If there isn't a reward, which doesn't have to be financial or like a piece of cake, it could just be a feeling of inner glow or accomplishment. But if there's no good feeling that comes afterwards, we're likely to get to stages one, two, three, and then not do it again. Reward is what makes the loop and makes us do the behavior again the next time. Let's take an example, not from language learning, um, of eating a donut. Eating a donut is the behavior, but what happened before that? What was the cue? Maybe the cue was walking past the donut shop and seeing the donut, or maybe the cue was a feeling of boredom um, and restlessness and either seeing the donut shop or feeling bored, the cue would have triggered a desire, oh, I'd love a donut now. Then you eat the donut, and the reward is all of that fat and sugar that acts on your neurotransmitters and makes you feel in the moment really great and tells your brain, I want that again. If you do this enough times, if every time you walk past the donut shop or every time you feel bored, you eat a donut, your brain will start to associate the cue with that reward of feeling good and a habit will be formed. This sounds like something negative. Um, I use an example of the kind of bad habit that people try to break, but knowing this anatomy of a habit gives us a lot of power to intervene, to actively try and form the habits we really want. And in this case, for this webinar, a language learning habit. James Clear, to whom I'm indebted for coming up with this um, description of a habit, had four suggestions for places in the habit process where we can intervene to make it more likely that something becomes a habit. We can enhance the cue by making it really obvious. So we can't miss the cue. We can make the craving bigger by making the thing really attractive. We can make it more likely that we actually do the response by making it easy. And lastly, we can up the reward by making the behavior really satisfying. Ideally, we would do all four of these things, but we can also try with hacking a habit by just trying one of them but it's more effective if we do all four of them in parallel. And I'm gonna look at how we can do this for language learning. The first stage is make the cue bigger, make it obvious. And a really easy way you can do that is just tweak your environment a little bit. Could you create some reminders to study? Could you put some post-it notes on the wall? Could you leverage notifications on your phone to set yourself notifications of times you want to study or classes that you want to attend? Could you display posters and summaries around your home so that you can't help but see them and be reminded of reviewing that vocabulary or grammar point? 
I used to have a big poster with German um, articles and adjective endings and I couldn't not see it all the time. Could you place your learning material in an obvious place? If your habit that you were trying to get was reading 30 minutes of Norwegian before going to bed, if you put your novel in Norwegian on your pillow every morning, you can't help but notice it in the evening before you go to bed and that will cue you to do your reading. Of course, the biggest way to tweak your environment and make the cues super obvious is to spend time in a country where the language is spoken. I know this isn't practical for everyone um, and it's not a realistic option for lots of people depending on their circumstances, but if you can, this is the biggest tweak of all because then you can't help but be cued all the time to encounter the language. If you were living in Germany and you were learning German and you wanted that donut, you couldn't even get the donut without being cued to speak German first. The second way to make it obvious is to use the strategy of scheduling. If it's in the calendar, it's gonna happen. That's definitely true for me. Once something's made it onto my calendar, it's almost certainly gonna happen. You might use your own calendar for this, um, or the platform that you're learning on might provide a calendar for you. This here is Lingoda's calendar, where they show you with a blue dot the days where you have classes. You can see that I had a French class scheduled for today. And to increase the likelihood of actually making it to the class that you've scheduled, you can combine that with notifications and reminders, set your phone to remind you to go if that's a problem for you. You can also set yourself reminders to schedule your next class when the last one finishes. That's often a danger point for people. It's definitely a danger point for me when one course ends, if I don't immediately book the next one, that can be a point where the habit slides and I had a really good habit and it can kind of drift. And you might also want to increase the likelihood of following through on the scheduling by using social accountability and pre-commitment to up your motivation to follow through. So if you knew that your teacher would be waiting for you and disappointed if you didn't turn up, or if you were agreed to meet a tandem partner and they'd be waiting for you in the cafe to talk, that social accountability and pressure is likely to make you more likely to want to come. The same if you paid for a course up front or bought learning credits up front, you're going to be motivated to use them because you've pre-committed some resources to that activity. The third way of making it obvious is to use a device called habit. F. Um, so habit stacking is a way of using a habit you've already got to create a habit that you want to develop. So what you need to do is identify a habit you already have at about the right frequency in your life. And you might think, I don't have any habits, but I can assure you that if you look over your day and what you do, you'll be able to find lots of things that you really reliably do every day. Brushing your teeth, drinking your first cup of coffee, coming home from work, um, commuting to work, things that already happen. And you can take advantage of the pre-existing habit that's already inbuilt as a fully formed habit, and you can tack on a new habit that you're trying to develop and do them at the same time, using the formula when, mm -hmm, then. Mm -hmm. So when I sit down with my first cup of coffee, I'll read the news headlines in Swedish. And it's quite fun to do this because these can be very small habits that you want to pair together. While I wait for the coffee, now while I wait for the kettle to boil, I will speak one word of Spanish out loud. And you're already waiting for the kettle to boil many times every day. So if you just learn to associate saying a sentence out loud with waiting for the kettle to boil, you've got an almost instant habit. The next strategy is about the craving. And this is about making it attractive. So whatever the behavior is you're trying to develop, tweak the behavior to make it something you actually want to do. And we're so lucky in learning languages that the habit we're trying to develop is something we can do in really varied ways. There's so many paths to fluency. There's so many paths to developing our language skills that there's really no reason to pick a method that you don't find fun and interesting. I recommend making learning a social activity learning in a group, um, lots of people on Lingoda really enjoy learning in a group with people from all over the world in their classes and that can become part of the attraction of attending. It's really good to build real relationships if that's something that's rewarding for you. You could look for a tandem partner. Um, there's platforms like tandem.net 
on apps that they have where you can find someone who's learning your language, you're learning theirs, and you can build a friendship at the same time as helping each other learn languages. Look for classes with engaging teachers and content. We have the whole plethora of the internet out there. We have access to so many amazing teachers. There's no reason to stick with content that isn't interesting to you. And that goes for content that you consume as well, um, like multimedia that you might read or books. My real um, message to you is think about what interests you and what you genuinely would be motivated and excited to read in your first language and look for that kind of material in the language you're learning. If you're interested in politics, read the news. If you follow influences on social media, follow similar influences in areas you're interested in, in the language, who post in the language that you're trying to learn. If you have a hobby, whatever your hobby is, there'll be a magazine, there'll be a blog about that hobby in the language you're learning. And this isn't only true for beginners, There's, for, for advanced learners with authentic content, this is also true for beginners that nowadays there's so many graded readers on all sorts of topics that you'll definitely be able to find something interesting for you. If it's a less interesting task that you just can't get around, consider pairing it with something you really want to do. Let's say studying grammar is not your thing, but you know it's a necessary evil and you want to get it done. Consider pairing it with something you really do want to do. Consider pairing it with your morning coffee that you really love or allowing yourself to watch a YouTube video that you normally wouldn't watch afterwards so that you associate the activity you don't really want to do with something you really do want to do. The next strategy, which is for me one of the most important ones, is make it easy. And this is about the response and the likelihood of us actually doing the behavior. As humans, we are ridiculously influenced by convenience. And the easier something is to do, the more likely we are to do it. The harder something is to do, the less likely we are to do it, regardless of our levels of kind of abstract motivation. So we want to look, how can we remove friction from the process of learning a language? Chip and Dan Heath call this shaping the path. Don't try and change yourself, try and change your environment. If you experience resistance within yourself around an activity, be curious, what's the actual block? Identify the block and tweak it. Maybe you want to think about how you get to classes. You might notice that you're always dragging your feet about going to your Korean class in the evenings. And then you think, well, no wonder it's the other side of town and I have to take five buses to get there and it's cold and rainy. Can you find a more convenient option? Can you find a school around the corner? Or could you learn online where there's no friction around getting yourself to class? The same with your materials. Can you prepare that in advance so you don't have the hassle of having to find all the things you need for studying? Maybe a teacher or a tutor or a platform can help you find the materials you need for study so you're not putting together your own program and having lots of extra effort and friction from this. Or perhaps your problem is time. Maybe you're very motivated and you're really enjoying learning but the friction is you're very busy and you just don't have time for it. In that case, consider how can you fit learning into your daily life? Can you combine activities? Could you listen to a podcast while you're commuting? Could you review your flashcards on the bus? The next way to make it easy is to make it tiny. BJ Fogg was the researcher who coined the term tiny habits and he wrote a book, which I really recommend called Tiny Habits which is about making the behavior as small as possible. If you don't currently have a habit of studying for three hours a day, you're unlikely to be able to jump straight in and form that as a fully fledged habit. Instead, scale it back to the very smallest possible version of your desired behavior. BJ Fogg recommends turning it into something you can do in 30 seconds. James Clear goes a bit more, a little bit more generous and says two minutes, but either way, make it absolutely tiny and establish the tiny, tiny habit uh, and scale up the tiny, tiny habit only once it's really established and comfortable. You might even want to use a starter step, even before you really do the behavior to build the habit of the habit, which is where you're not doing the behavior itself, but you're doing one step towards it to get yourself into the momentum of doing this thing. Let's take an example. We talked earlier about our learner whose aspiration was to understand French better and decided that 
their desired behavior was watching 20 minutes of a French TV series a day. That's a really great place to be trying to get to, but it's quite a big place to start. If you're not currently studying languages for 20 minutes a day, that's a big step and it's unlikely to take as a habit straight away. You could begin with a starter step of just saying, for a week or however long it takes, I'm just going to press play on a French YouTube video or a French series. The likelihood is once you press play, you're gonna be like, well, I'm watching now, I might as well keep going. But the only thing you actually commit yourself to do and require yourself to do is press play. The tiny habit version, which is where we make a micro version of the big habit, might be to watch two minutes of a French YouTube video a day. And once you've got comfortable watching two minutes, you can scale it up over time, but never overwhelming yourself by trying to do a really big ambitious thing straight away. The final strategy of habit forming, which is really important and we can't skip, is make it satisfying. This is about the reward. We need to make sure that the behavior feels satisfying and rewarding to increase the chance of repeating it again. There are lots of ways to do this. You could celebrate inwardly, cheerleading yourself. You could use a habit tracker. This is actually very satisfying. This is when you get a calendar or a dedicated habit tracker and you put an X on every day that you accomplish the habit. And after a while, you'll want to keep the streak. You won't want to break the chain. You'll see I've done it 30 days in a row. It'd be a pity to stop now and break my, break my streak. You'll want to find other ways too to chart your progress because sometimes in language learning, especially when we're not beginners anymore or if we're at an intermediate stage or advanced stage, it's harder to see the progress we're making and we can become frustrated and demotivated. So it can help to make a list of the words that you've learned or the concepts that you've mastered. And it might also be a nice idea to record yourself speaking at different stages in your learning progress so that you can see how far you've come. You'll be amazed if you record yourself speaking at monthly intervals, how quickly when you look back, you'll be like, wow, I thought I've improved so much more than I thought I had. And lots of ed tech platforms also have ways of gamifying this and giving us rewards. And um, this is Lingoda's motivational, um, keeping the streak um, feature where your flame gets bigger the more lessons you take. So you get some visual feedback on your progress towards booking and scheduling lessons. There are lots of tools that you might find useful um, for all of these stages. I've mentioned a habit tracker. This is an example, this picture here. You can make it yourself, you can draw it by hand. If you just Google habit tracker, you'll find lots of templates online that you can print out or you can buy them. Um, lots of people also like to combine a habit tracker with a bullet journal. There's an example of this below. And again, if you Google bullet journal, you'll find loads and loads of examples and lots of pages on Pinterest. And this is essentially a self-made calendar that people make to accomplish their goals and track their progress. But you might want to automate this. There's lots of habit tracking apps. Um, a couple of good ones, Habitica, Habitify, Productive but it's most important to find one that works well for you so that you can build streaks and track your progress. And lastly, I just wanna give a little plug for Lingoda lessons as a way to schedule classes and increase your external accountability and pre-commitment by booking credits. And in particular, the Lingoda sprint is I think the feature of Lingoda that's most useful for habit forming. This is an offer that's run several times a year where you pre-commit to taking 30 or 60 classes within two months as a sprint or a super sprint. And if you manage to do it, you get 50 or 100% cash back. So there's a big reward built in there as well for regular learning. Um, the closing date for sign up for this sprint actually is in one day. The next sprint starts on the 28th. So this could be something you wanna consider. I have some suggestions for further reading if you're interested. Um, all of these books really help me understand habits better. If I had to pick just one or just two, perhaps I would say Atomic Habits and by James Clear and Better Than Before by Gretchen Rubin. They both come from different perspectives of understanding the habits of our daily lives. And if you read them, even though they don't talk about language learning a lot, you can extract lots and lots of useful ideas for hacking your own language learning progress. These are my references and that brings my talk to a close. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much to everyone who joined. Um, I'm really sorry that I couldn't interact with you more via the chat. I'd have loved to hear 
more about your habits that you're forming and um, hear more from you. But thanks nonetheless for sticking with it. And um, I hope that you had at least maybe one idea that you can take away with you that will help you um, on your language learning journey.